You're listening to Make It Big, a podcast about all things e-commerce, created by Big Commerce. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning into our Make It Big podcast. I'm Melissa Dixon, Director of Content Marketing at Big Commerce, and today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, marketing trends. So to join in the conversation and offer some expert insights, we have Richard Lindner, co-founder and president at Digital Marketer. Richard, thanks so much for joining us and welcome to our show. Hey, Melissa. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. So as a fellow career marketer, I am super excited to be speaking with you today. You have such a fantastic breadth of experience in the digital marketing space. Tell us a little bit about how you got started and also ultimately what led to you founding Digital Marketer. Absolutely. I got started 100% by accident. I I did not intend to go into marketing, much less digital marketing. When I first started, I didn't really understand the internet and wasn't all that tech savvy, but I happened upon a business mentor who was a serial entrepreneur and had just transitioned from the traditional brick and mortar into online and was able to mentor and almost apprentice under him as he really went from offline to online and quickly grew a 20 to $40 million business in a very short time, just leveraging the internet and very, very early days. So at no point in time, then when I couldn't barely spell the internet, much less tell someone how to get on it and what to do with once they were there, the thought of founding a company or co-founding a company that taught other people how to market effectively and efficiently online, I would have never imagined. The path from that to where we are today was just a lot of doing. We maintained that serial entrepreneur bug and launched a ton of new businesses, launched or acquired, leveraged the media that we own to stand up new properties or new businesses and saw a ton of growth. We started teaching what we were doing because different founders and principals were being asked to speak on different events and share what was working. And we started productizing some of that knowledge and charging for it, making courses in very early course days. But we always saw it as a way to sell the byproduct of what we were doing to reinvest into our quote unquote real businesses. Yeah. And we started a kind of a convention. We started an event called Traffic and Conversion Summit 11 years ago and had the first one in Austin, Texas. And the third year in a row, a thousand people paid to come. That was before Digital Marketer existed. It was then that we stood back a little bit in awe and said, I don't think this is what the kids would call today a side hustle. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. So I think we've engaged an audience and we need to serve that audience. So it was day two of Traffic and Conversion Summit 3 when we made a commitment to launch Digital Marketer. And because we are the consummate planners, we announced it on day three of year three at Traffic and Conversion Summit. So there was something about that extreme ownership, extreme accountability, and just going all in. That's where it accidentally started and how we ended up here with Digital Marketer. That's awesome. I love that story. Let's talk about the current state of marketing. I know it may sound like maybe an overly simplified question, but How would you describe marketing in 2021? What does it mean to you? So Melissa, I'll tell you, I love that you asked the question, how would you describe marketing? Because most people say, what's the state of digital marketing? How would you describe digital marketing? Here's the great news in 2021. All marketing is digital marketing. Digital marketing is marketing. It's just marketing now. At some point, no matter where you're marketing through a digital platform or not, your marketing transitions over to digital right? It's either digital ad space or you're going to the web at some point. So everything is becoming digital. Radio ads are driving to digital. TV ads are driving to digital. Print ads are driving to digital. So the origin of marketing, right? The origin of how you engage or make your person aware of your marketing message may be one thing. It may not always start digitally, but everything comes back to digital. So digital is mainstream. Like that's what we saw during the pandemic was digital and automation and some of the things that a lot of e-commerce businesses and information publishing businesses and just publishing businesses and SaaS companies have known and have had access to for a while in software and automation has kind of become mainstream. Like regular brick and mortar businesses are now aware and have to take this seriously. Digital marketing is now marketing. All marketing is digital. What we saw this year, this past year during the the pandemic is we saw 10 years worth of growth in online sales. Yeah. 
right? I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. So what the pandemic forced, it can never take away. There are new habits, right? We all form new habits. The first three months of COVID, 10 years of growth, like there's no signs of stopping. And even though the world may open back up and we may go back to some aspect of what used to be as we're establishing our new normal, those buying trends are not going away. Right. What we expect as consumers from even non-online businesses, those expectations will not be reduced back to pre-pandemic days. Like all marketing is going to be digital. That is not industry specific, business model specific. That is world specific. I know. It's so fascinating too. When I talk to people, there's a lot of people wondering, oh, what trends are here to stay and which ones are reverting? And the answer from my perspective, and it sounds like yours as well, is nothing's reverting. There might be some semblance of things from before, but everything is different now. It's a different world. It's a different landscape. Expectations are different. It's just the amount of growth we've experienced in this condensed time has just altered everything so significantly. And I think the thing that's been so interesting to consider for merchants too, and for these brands now trying to stand out in a saturated digital space. And how do you compete and create emotional connections with customers, especially during this altered pandemic lifestyle, which now is starting to dissipate a little bit. But I wonder, what are some of the largest trends that you've seen across different customer segments in 2021? And how are people really competing? Great question. And I love your, we're not going back. No. Right? What's the new normal? makes me think of the very first personal slash professional development book I ever bought for myself and read myself was Who Moved My Cheese? <laughs> and all I kept thinking during the pandemic was like, this is so the real life extreme version of that book. Like if we keep going back to where the cheese used to be and it's never going to be there instead of going and looking for it, accepting the changes in our reality, we're all going to die of starvation. Yeah. Right. So I love that. As far as standing out and engaging your brands, I hear and constantly get asked a lot about like, what about Gen Z versus millennials and how do boomers fit in when we're trying to engage them? And we can put customers into audience segments. And we have to be very careful with some of the demographic information that we overlay because at the end of the day, the basics are what's going to matter, right? The basics remain true. The marketer's job is to channel and direct customers' desires, not create it, Right. We're not here to create desires. We're here to channel their existing desires, right? So we're here to understand their, their pain. We're here to understand their hopes and their fears. And we're here to connect our product or service offerings as the bridge between where they're at now, the pain that they currently experience and their desires, their ideal or desired future. And the job of marketing is to articulate the transformation between today's current state and the future ideal state. So it doesn't really matter whether you're a Gen Z or a millennial or a boomer or what side you fall on politically or whether you're an e-com or a brick and mortar. None of that stuff actually matters as far as segmentation and marketing. Understanding the ideal customer's pain point, understanding their hopes and desires, and clearly articulating how you can expedite their success is marketing. That's it. That blanket will cover marketing to any customer segment that you can come up with. So the companies that get it will work deeply to understand their customers. They'll work to understand what drives them, their deepest fears, their deepest desires, and they'll channel it into their marketing message. And they'll stand out because when their ideal customer reads that, hears that, sees that, they'll go, holy crap, they get me. They're talking to me. That's how you stand out. But if you do not understand then you can make no emotional connection. And what you're doing is throwing tactics at a poorly written message. It just doesn't matter. So you shouldn't amplify it. And no channel or tactic or funnel or type of ad is going to change the fact that you are truly uninspiring in your message and your promise. Okay, I love what you're saying because I've always been a huge proponent of empathetic marketing. Of course, as a content marketer too, you know, it's so crucial sure. and understanding those pain points. And I'm wondering though, for our listeners that might be looking for ways to build those emotional connections, what is your perspective on how to really become an expert in empathetic marketing and how to truly understand your audience and build that connection? Yeah. What are some of the ways they can do that? I fully understand that a lot of marketers 
and a lot of e-commerce store business owners and any kind of digital marketer, there's a high probability that they are uh, potentially an introvert. I get that. I can suffer from that as well. I can play an extrovert on TV, but at the end of the day, I'm an introvert. And I preface this because I'm pre-apologizing and I'm telling the introverts out there, you can do it. It's okay. The first step in figuring out how do you clearly articulate what your customers are saying or feeling, right? What's the conversation that they're already having, whether or not you're participating or not, you got to talk to them. You have to talk to them. And I don't mean through a form, like a hundred customer conversations. That should be your goal. When the headline on your website is just a tightened up version of something your ideal customer has said to you 15 times or more, when their ideal customer that's never heard of you hits it, it'll resonate with them. The type of content you're creating should just be content that would solve the problem or make the average day better of that customer you've already talked to. You need to have real conversations with your customers to understand that pain, to understand the desires, and to kind of start to walk a mile in their shoes for lack of a better term. Exactly. There's so many ways to do that. I think just tactically speaking, it can be connecting with your customer support team and really understanding the feedback, you know, looking at insights. I do love the idea of putting yourself in your in your customer's shoes too by going through the whole site experience, the whole purchase experience mm. and actually buying something and receiving it. There's a lot you can learn that way too. Ways to build empathy. You call out some great ones there. And and to me, I agree with you. I think that insights that come directly from your customer and really understanding and seeing what they're going through and experiencing it for yourself is, is the way to do that. Yeah. Or I'll tell you one little secret. This is kind of my, you know, if I'm going to do this, I really want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. Send it to your mom. <laughs> yes. Send it to your mom and have her buy it. or your dad or your brother or your best friend, or even worse, your best friend's mom, the person that like was there with you. If you send whatever your customer experiences to them and allow them to experience it and then give you the feedback. One, I bet you go through it and look at it through a different lens or filter before you press send. Two, I bet you take that feedback a little bit more seriously because you actually have an emotional connection to the person who's feeling it. So if you want to know like the ultimate gut check, and it may not be your mom. I realize, you know, everyone doesn't, doesn't, isn't lucky enough to still have a mom, right? May not be a dad. It may be like, who is that person that is important to you? And are you willing to say, here's what I ask my customer to do? Would you please do this and give me feedback? And if you can't press send on that email, there's a bit of a problem already that you need to address. But the good news is we just press the pain button. Absolutely. I love that. I love that especially with the holidays coming up in a few months. That's something that mm. I think people should hold themselves accountable to do. I agree. That reminds me because we're talking about some of these ideas with like customer insights and gut checking your brand experience and your shopping experience. And I think a lot of it comes back to getting back to the basics in marketing, those basic things that can help you win. What do you feel like are some of those foundational strategies that businesses should keep in mind to create a strong marketing base? Great question. I think you're right. So often it's time to get back to basics. As marketers, as business owners, we are so quick to look for the new and shiny, right? Look for what's that new tactic? What's that new platform? What's that new funnel? What's that new ad? Um, but if we if we don't have that strong foundation, then we are just one hit wonder. So I think it starts first with your customer journey. Do you have a documented customer journey? Do you know how people become aware that you exist? What is that best first experience that you could create that someone stumbles across your brand? What's the first thing they see? Is it content? Is it a written article? Is it a blog post? Like what is that first ideal experience? And then from there, how do they ascend through the value journey? So. They're now aware that you exist. You know, how do you engage with them? How do they subscribe? How do they convert? Like, what do they buy? What's that first time buying experience like? You know, then how do we continue to excite and ascend them? Uh, a digital marketer, everything goes back to the customer value journey. And we look at a holistic journey and then say, what marketing channels, what marketing levers do we pull to deploy or expedite this particular stage of the value journey? Right? I think tailoring your marketing message across the journey, which is usually omni-channel, 
right? It's making sure that we know across multiple channels that we have one goal and one message that we're deploying to our customer. I think a lot of the times we look at these different channels, right? Because they may be on like social may be owned by someone, maybe it's outsourced or maybe it's owned by one team and the blog or the content strategy may be owned by another team and product sourcing and creation may be owned by another team and customer service may be owned by another team. So all of these become siloed, right? Paid acquisition or demand gen may be owned by another team. And if every team has autonomy and unique ownership and they're deploying their message to the same customer that the other, another department may be deploying a totally different message to, then we are one company shouting at one person in five different voices with five different messages. <laughs> ah, that's never going to give a sense of clarity and calm, right? I mean, we're at, at best, we're going to seem like we kind of don't know what's going on. And that's best case scenario. So I think it is understanding and being intentional about your ideal customer value journey, tailoring your marketing message across that journey, across all channels. And, and just here's a big one. Like email marketing is and always will be the highest ROI activity any marketer can use. The beautiful thing about email marketing, it expedites every stage of the journey, but only when you're you have a documented plan only only when you know which way um, you're you're driving people. And if we're just thinking of what are they hearing in email and that has nothing to do with what are they hearing in social, what are they hearing in paid, what are they hearing and being shown on the blog, then you know we invited someone new to the party and we have five people shouting at them. Yeah, that cohesion is crucial. And on that note, when you're talking about these basics, it reminds me a little bit of the key components of a good marketing campaign and thinking about the copy and the content and the design mm. and really being mindful about your approach with all of those. So I did kind of want to talk through those. As someone who's made a career out of writing, I of course know firsthand that copy is paramount. It's a direct line to tap into your audience's emotions, to build that empathy like we've been talking about, nurturing relationships and building loyalty. And because of that, I think it's so important for brands to really take that empathetic approach and, and really be human and be relatable and conversational. So I'd love to know from your perspective what you view as, as some of the fundamentals of good copywriting and why, why you think they're so important. Yeah. And I love that you said conversational especially in email. So, I mean, copy is copy. We should be broken up and chunked out and copy chunks should be used to drive to bigger copy chunks. But what I see all the time is someone pulls up Microsoft Word or a Google Doc and instead of having a conversation like you and I are, it becomes very formal. Even today, even when you think like, I don't know, I remember this will date me a bit. I remember having to like learn how to, in high school, write a formal letter, mm -hmm. like write a business letter. Yeah. I see marketers that just like revert to this tone of formal speak in, in marketing messages. And that is the best way to not form a connection, right? So the conversational tone is critical. I think the next step is kind of knowing who you're talking to. If you understand... I love what you said, empathetic marketing, right? If you understand the hopes and dreams, the desires and outcomes of your customer and you understand the frustrations today, then that's step one. Now we have to clearly articulate those, right? Here's where you're at and here's where you want to be. And here is how whatever I'm offering you will expedite your journey there, right? So, so much of marketing is conversational, but it's very clear and concise. It's benefit-based. We start with the benefit. And I think I see in marketing, people confuse features with benefits. Does that, does that make sense? Oh yeah, for sure. So what's the benefit of driving a Mercedes Benz versus a Kia? Like both are automobiles, both get you to the same place. Both have very different avatars, although they are people who are looking to transport themselves from one place to another in an automobile, right? But you have to know what you're selling. You know, when, when you're selling a Mercedes Benz, you're, you're selling a car, but you're selling a status symbol, right? They're buying status elevation. They're buying identity reinforcement. I think that's important. What is your ideal customer buying? And think about it like that. If the difference between a, maybe a Kia and, and assuming, you know, budgets are the same, right? If I could buy either, why would I buy a Mercedes instead of a Kia? 
if I buy the Kia, my identity is I'm, I'm frugal, right? I budget, I plan for the future. If I'm buying a Mercedes, my identity is, you know, I like the finer things in life. It is a luxury status symbol, right? It is a outward reinforcement of the identity that I want internally. So what are you selling? Not the widget, not the SaaS, not the, you know, not the information product, no matter what is, what is it that, that your people are actually seeking by purchasing and, and, and lead there, right? Sell the benefit, not the feature. Great copywriting focuses on opening the doors to new realities and possibilities to achieve a customer's existing desire, right? That's it. Yeah. Like, and if you can't come up with that unique thing that makes you interesting, then you've missed in copy. You have a great product and really boring copy and no one gets it. And that's, that's a copy problem, right? So go back and, and figure out like, what is, what is the big idea? What's the new reality or possibility that I'm presenting? I also wanted to talk about content overall because we're talking about talking about copy and I think there is a tendency for copy and content to be conflated. And it's important to delineate because copy is really just one component of content. Copy is the words, but content so much more than that. It's the final output in the form of different content types, videos, podcasts, web pages, infographics, all of that. So what's been so amazing now about the landscape and where we currently are is that marketers have access to so many different content mediums, you know? So what have you seen this year, especially that you think is really resonating? What types of content is really resonating with consumers right now? Perhaps podcasts, but there's definitely so much more. Definitely. What are your thoughts on that? Right now, I think audio is huge, right? I just, I think it is. So podcasting was obviously already huge during the pandemic. It just grew. I think you saw it's like shorter radio shows and almost radio shows that, that more people could participate in like clubhouse really kick off. And you're seeing, you know, some of the social platforms launch similar features from branding and advertising perspective. I think podcasting is there. I think that is a great way to make potential customers uh, aware of your existence and also to continue to engage the customers who already know you exist. Right. I think that is, that is amazing. I think Clubhouse is a way where if you want to have a hundred customer conversations really quickly, like we talked about before, you know, really be intentional about how you name your room and go build a room and, and share some great content, like super valuable stuff that only your ideal customer would, would be interested in and then let them talk. That's the great thing about Clubhouse. Like you, you get to have conversations and, and, and there's this, you know, viral, organic, like I'm going to invite these people and I'm going to make this person a host. And those, those conversations can be invaluable. I think there's a lot of value there in cementing this author expert platform and furthering that, but there's a ton of product and marketing research value there and having those conversations. So again, anything audio is huge. I have a bit of a concern as we start to enter into, you know, an, an opening up as, as we're thinking of like, you know, what is this new reality that we'll see some backlash of the things that people were drawn to when seeking connection during the pandemic that maybe the plot, like a, like a zoom, right? Like where I think audio is great. I think there could be a bit of a rejection or a backlash of these digital meetings, right? Of, you know, non face to face of like, I know conferences that are able to go in person are selling out like crazy because people want connection and they want live connection. So I think as we're talking about what's working now, audio is going to be there. What's the future of video, especially live video meetings? It'll always be there. Will it dip a bit once we are in a more open you know, reality and we can, we can gather potentially? I think so. So as you're starting to, to greenlight marketing initiatives and you're looking at platform and, and media, try to ask yourself, what did people maybe feel a little overexposure of during this, this quarantine time, during this pandemic? And how is my brand positioned with that, that media? Am I leaning into it when people are going to be rejecting it? Or am I standing over here in the, the thing that they're rejecting it for? Like that's going to be really, really powerful as we 
figure out our new normal. Yeah. And having to balance it because like we talked about in the beginning, you know, expectations have, have shifted, right? So when you're talking about something like virtual and in-person events, I feel that the expectation is now that there has to be a virtual component, right? Oh. Because we've like, but at the same time, you don't want to over-index on that because just like you're saying, now people are excited to get out of the house. So it's going to be about balancing both and making sure you're meeting, you know, you're meeting your customers' needs, your audience's needs there. That's challenging. Yeah. To truly empathize with them, you have to understand where they are and you have to understand that a hundred percent of them are nowhere. Especially when you, when you're like, what's your position on, should we all gather? Shouldn't we? Well, somewhere around 50, 50. Right. Right. And, and uh, what you said is so dead on what is something that's changed forever that will never be the same live events. They will never, there will never be a time in my opinion that we, there is not a virtual uh, attendance option. Right. Exactly. That is here now. So, and, and if you are, an, if you're, if you have an event, boy, you better be intentional. Like it was fine at one point to say, we're just going to do this one virtually and to do your best to engage and provide content, provide the experience. Well, now when we live in this hybrid or dual event, you better have someone who owns the attendee experience for live and someone who owns the attendee experience for virtual. And you better be intentional about both of them. Because if you're, you know, if you're speaking to the camera and speaking to the audience, it's a different thing. And if the same person is being displayed in the same place, mm -hmm. someone's going to feel left out. Yeah. And you're always going to choose the person you can't see. Mm, interesting. Think about that. If you're in person, if you and I are together right now and there's a bunch, let's just pretend yeah. that we're together and there's a bunch of people watching this, right? Who are we going to prioritize? Just the social constructs of our society say that we are going to optimize for the people that are in our area because it's awkward if we don't. Right, right. That means there are a ton of people that we are not making eye contact, that we're speaking over because of how we're looking at, that we're speaking through, not to. So this is going to get interesting. And I think that's why video is going to matter. There was one other thing I wanted to say just when we were talking about audio. Obviously, I agree. That's why we're <laughs> that's why we launched our podcast at Big Commerce. And one of the reasons that I personally was such a huge proponent of it is because I love the emotional connection you can establish with voice. You're literally putting, you know, a voice to the to the brand voice it is mm -hmm. the actual physical embodiment so i think you know since we've talked so much about empathetic marketing i think that audio can really be a way for for marketers to tap in and easily connect when you hear someone's voice you know you can hear all the emotion you get to know that person so i love this audio surge this audio renaissance i'm into it i'm here for it <laughs> same okay well there was one thing cuz we were talking about the different components of a successful campaign. And we talked about mm, yes. copy and content, but I wanted to get back to design. You know, I think, especially now as consumers in a saturated digital space, we absorb so many different types of ads and visit countless e-commerce websites. So when it comes to graphic design and enhancing the brand experience, what do you think that brands should really focus on? So I think um, it, it kind of goes, and I'll reference something you just said as well with with audio and and being kind of the the connection, right? The mm -hmm. the physical manifestation of that brand, right? Or physical embodiment, the human embodiment of that brand. I think everything has to be in alignment, right? Like if if you look at your copy, your message has to be there, and if you're messaging empathy and understanding, then the voice in your podcast that has to be there. The design is just a little bit deeper in, but it has to, it has to all say the same thing. Like images need to represent your customer's core desire. Think of the average day of your customer today and think of the average desired average day, no matter what it is. If it's a, if it's a widget, if it's clothing, if it's coffee, it does not matter. What are you selling? Remember, like what are what are you marketing? Are you marketing happiness? Are you marketing luxury and and kind of like mm -hmm. is it status elevation? But images need to represent the before and the after. So 
when you're looking at your at your site, whether it's a, a landing page or a product page or a cart, right? Your your checkout. Like, how are you reinforcing that message? So I think again, images need to represent the customer's core desire. If your average day of your customer is, you know, is bad, if they're sad, if they're if they're confused, if they're lonely, if they feel less than, then making sure that anytime you're speaking of that, that you're intentional in that design. What are the colors? What's the imagery? Is it going to be full color or is it black and white? Like getting super meta into mm-hmm. color theory, into what is our brand design on on images? Are we going going to be like hand drawn, more cartoon? Are we photo, you know, what does that mean? How do we show a happy customer, right? I think if you look like Peloton published their, or I don't know if they published it, someone published it. I don't think it was an intentional thing by Peloton, published their kind of brand image guide. Yes. And it was very intentional as to where the bike had to be positioned, the type of home. It couldn't look cluttered, Mm -hmm. right? Why couldn't it look cluttered? Well, if you're going to buy a Peloton, put it in your house. Yeah. It's a piece of art. It's a piece of furniture. You don't want to feel like, uh, this is embarrassing. There's less space. You need to think it needs to be displayed, right? It had to be so far from all the different things. People needed to have a, it's said in there, they need to have a glow about mm-hmm. them. They need to be sweaty, but they need to have a glow. Uh, all of this stuff was intentional. That was the after state, right? They understood this is how our product exists in our ideal customer's life. This is how imagery is used to show what successful like use and benefit of this product looks like. So you have to ask yourself a question like, if your customer's in the, de- the desired after state, their ideal, like the reason they purchased your product, how do they look? How do they feel and how does someone who feels like that look? Where is your product? Is it front and center or is it back here? Are you the hero or the guide? It, no right answer. But be intentional about it. So I think all of the design, whether it's UI, UX and understanding that flow or whether it's imagery and graphics and understanding that they are an extension of our messaging and what stops people from buying and engaging and being heard is conflict. So when your words and your actions are in direct conflict with one another, people are out. When your words and your imagery, same thing, they're out. Conflict, when you contradict yourself, intentionally or unintentionally, people feel disconnected, people feel manipulated, people don't buy, people don't hang around, people don't t- talk about you in a positive light, at least, to their friends. So man, design and imagery and, and all of this stuff matters. It is an extension of your messaging. It's an extension of your brand. It's not just something that you know Layout decided to slap up there because they have a stock image uh, subscription. So then it becomes break down the silos, identify the conflicts and resolve them or remove them. It's kind of the whole idea of like frictionless purchase too. You just remove any barriers. So many good takeaways. I could talk about this for hours, <laughs> but I don't want to hold you hostage here. So what would you say for our audience, if they're to leave with maybe one or two key takeaways, what would those be? What do you want them to walk away with? First, I think you have to truly know your customer before marketing works, right? So don't focus on the tactic. Don't focus on the channel. Uh, Focus on understanding them and then creating a message that conveys that understanding, right? That's first. Look at tactics and channels as amplification of a message that works, If you don't have the message that works, don't start with amplification, right? So that's the first thing that I would say. And another thing that I think we all have to be thinking about right now is let's be super intentional about the things that we may have been overexposed to as a population during this pandemic, during quarantine, and look at things that people found uh, connection and engagement with that maybe they no longer find that. Maybe it occupies now the opposite side. And make sure that you're not unintentionally anchoring your brand to that. But to Melissa's point, you know, how do you make sure that you don't isolate your customer base because that is such a hot topic so that n- neither are, are left kind of in the wind, 
right? So I think I think that's a big one. And and really, again, that message, like message, message, message. To truly serve them, you have to tell them how how you serve them, and they have to receive it and understand the benefit of what that would mean. So benefit, not feature. Again, don't flee to tactics and platform until you have those foundational marketing elements nailed down. Yeah. Bring it back to basics. I like it. All right, Richard, if our listeners want to connect with you after this, where can they find you? Digitalmarketer.com. Come check us out. We've got a great email newsletter once a week, direct to your inbox. We've got a ton on customer value journey, free templates. If you were saying the customer value journey sounds great, I don't know what that is for me or my customer. Like, Come on over to, to digitalmarketer.com. There's a ton of free blog posts and articles and all kinds of stuff on the customer value journey. Like, Let us help you understand your customer and, and know how to market to them. I, we'd love to do that. That's, that's our mission. You're our ideal customer. And I would love nothing more than to serve you. Lots of good content there at Digital Marketer. I can attest to that. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, Richard. And for those listening in, stay tuned for more expert advice from other thought leaders, just like Richard on the Make It Big podcast. Thanks so much. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks for listening to the Make It Big podcast. Want even more insights and expert advice? Experience our Make It Big conference, now available on demand. You'll get e-commerce tips and strategies from global thought leaders like Mark Cuban, Anne Handley, and Neil Patel, plus big commerce partners like Google, TikTok, and more. Watch today at bigcommerce.com slash make it big.